And we're live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today on a Saturday afternoon. Um, we're going to have a really interesting discussion, I think. I mean, when is sex ever not interesting, right? Um, so we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, the title of the forum is Sex in the Digital Age. So yes, we're going to be covering things like social media and virtual sex. But if we really want to talk about sex in um, this age, we need to go back and talk about what it was like in the past as well and if and how it has changed uh, through the years. So I have with uh, me today um, Amirul uh, and Jasmine, as well as uh, Faisal, who will be joining us a bit uh, shortly. I think he's having some technical issues. Um, and I will let them uh, do a quick introduction on themselves as well as their focus and um, what they're going to be talking or sharing with us today. Um, so feel free to take it away, guys. Uh, okay, so I'll start first. So hi, everybody. My name is Jasmine King, and I am a sex positive advocate. I run a platform on social media called Oh Hey Miss King, where I basically, it serves as a sex positive and safe space for young Malaysian adults to come together and to discuss conversations and topics surrounding um, sexual health, intimacy, pleasure, and self-love. That's something that I'm really, really passionate in. And I really enjoy doing that. And I have, so aside from running that platform, I also give talks and I moderate events relating back to sexual health and sexual rights and reproductive rights as well. And as well as comprehensive sexuality education. That's something that I train towards. So I go to primary schools. I volunteer to go to primary schools to teach young girls, especially on puberty education. Nice. Um, Amiru? Oh, okay, hello. Um, I don't have a lot of things to tell about. I'm just a normal person in this very fast world. And, but I do believe on globalization and uh, it's benefit to all to all humankind. Um, I I'm a post grad student and also a part time researcher. Basically, I'm more into the state relation, and sometimes we also uh, do some research on state and society relations. So this topic might cut my also I mean somehow will overlap on my study on globalization and how states and society will behave towards all this uh, globalized sex in digital age. So uh, I will, this is my pleasure to have all of you in, in one hall. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm looking forward to hearing from you as well. Um, okay, Faisal is here. Hi, Faisal. Uh, feel free to turn your camera off if um, the internet is uh, not stable. Um, my line has been, my line is very, I mean, I don't know what happened. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Feel free to leave your camera off if the line is not stable. Um, Okay, so I think this line is pretty bad. So maybe we can start with um, some of the questions for for you guys first. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, Jasmine, you were talking about, you know, sex positive advocacy and how you're going into schools and uh, talking to young girls about puberty and things like that. Um, could you maybe explain more about like what it means to be sex positive? Mm. So sex positivity is a belief that all consensual sexual activities are healthy and pleasurable and that exploration is encouraged. There is no shaming and judging um, when it comes to someone's sex sexuality and preferences and sexuality as well. And so we also, someone who is sex positive also advocate for 
um, comprehensive sexuality education as well as safe sex. That's something that we really, really find important in. That's why there's a lot of now awareness on the importance of you know kind of reaching out and talking about you know safe sex and sort of what is the what is pornography and why it is not real sex as what a lot of people thought it might be. And so some of the sex positive conversations can include about of course. Um, breaking sexual expectation of men and women for example for men you are not manly enough if you do not get hard for a long time or talking about women that if you are that women cannot feel pleasure that there is something wrong with you if you feel pleasure so that's completely like breaking down the expectation and also conversations on body positivity and acceptance except celebrating different body sizes as well as flaws breaking taboos against period and reproductive health um, most importantly about consent. So we don't talk enough about consent and that's something that's a huge spectrum. And of course, puberty education for young children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I, like, I know this is happening in, in Malaysia, right? And uh, we're sort of a country that has, um, you know, we are, we're an Islamic country. So, um, Amirul, I, I noticed that you know you write a, a lot about like um, Islam and how it fits into our like political structure as well. How do you think, you know, with this kind of education and us being like an Islamic country, how do you think this um, could fit together? Like, is it something that uh, that our religion would encourage or like, you know? Well. Uh... It's quite hard. I mean, uh, of course, religion, and especially Islam, do allow sexual, any sexual uh, behavior. But of course, there are always a limit for that. Because, you know, everything that pleasurable, everything is pleasure, always come with punishment afterwards. If you do it more than, than its limits. So, of course, Islam do allow sexual behavior at certain point, but there's always a limit on it. You know, everything should have a limit. You know, if you drink or you use alcohol or whatever you use, should have a limit. So human or human being do not harm themselves. So this is why Islam set the limits for human being, for all humankind. What kind? Uh, sexual behavior that they allow to be I mean they allow to, 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 to practice and what kind of sexual behavior they are not allowed to to do right yeah um, that's that's quite interesting actually I would I would be curious to know as well like what's allowed and what's not allowed but um, perhaps we can we can uh, go into Perhaps we can we can we can talk about that as well, you know. Um. <clears throat> but one thing we have to know that uh, the sexual behavior or sexual attitude, mostly in, in Islam, mostly are constrained and limited in the private private sphere. You know, uh, Islam does not allow the state to intervene any sexual behavior unless it's very harmful for the society unless it's uh, outside of your private property or unless it's obviously harmful for, for the society. Mm-hmm. So Islam always take the balance between uh, personal and individual and the society because society are constructed by the individuals and of course it's vice versa. So Islam always see the society or they call it the ummah as a the ummah and an individual uh, have a very dynamic relation between of them and they have to collaborate with each other and respect each other because all because you know all individuals have different pressures have different way of thinking of course but how the individual uh, behavior will harm or affect the society that is one of the concern of islam and right. they have yeah Right. Yeah. So we're seeing that and, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, Western countries or even people with like more urban uh, Western mindsets think that 
uh, Malaysia is very conservative and there are all these restrictions with regards to our religion and things like that. But when you look at social media, sometimes you see that this really isn't the case. Like there are also, like what I've seen is that, um, you know, a lot of young people today are dancing to really explicit song lyrics on TikTok, like, you know, Ariana Grande's 34 plus 35 song. And um, like, how, how, how is that reconciliable with, you know, what we say about us being a very conservative society? And maybe Jasmine, you can, you can comment on this as well, because, um, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that you know porn is not the same as uh, sex, or it's not real sex. And what what would you say like this sort of thing on social media says about like porn culture or like the culture in Malaysia? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, basically, as with any culture, like we always have like an idea of how that culture is. But of course, like when you're actually living in that culture, and you kind of understand that it was so multifaceted. We're not just one type, right? Everybody have different personalities. Everybody have different upbringing, that sort of thing. So it's really, it's really nice that you sort of brought it out and say that actually, yes, this is what people think about us, but we're actually more than that. We're not just, you know, limited to that. Um, so yeah, we we. And this is the reason why I got into sexual education is because we are surrounded by pornography. We are surrounded. We live in a very highly sexualized world, right? Um, we, you can just switch on the TV. It's, there's going to be something sexual happening, even in advertisement, even in magazine. You know, like you can open a Malay magazine and it would be something about sexual, like, oh, Abang, uh, oh, Abang suka saya sebab macam ni. You know, like, saya sebab whatever. You know, it's highly sexualized. So in sex positivity, we discuss about why is it highly sexualized in this way and understanding how can we see that this is actually, that it shouldn't be this way, that we, it's like an educated consumption of all these materials. That is what sex positivity is all about. So understanding that pornography, it is not a representation of sex. It is a re-representation of sex. It is not real. That is not how we should treat um, We should treat our partners, especially we, that is not how we should treat women. And this idea of like, you know, um, trigger warning, raping scenes in pornography, how that is not real as well. So having to the ability to actually sit down and say, hey guys, you know, a, a pornography production, uh, a pornography video has a huge um, team behind it, taking pictures, taking videos, it's a full set. It is not how it should be. Um, and and I, as I mentioned earlier about consent, that sex positivity believes in the idea of consensual sexual activities are healthy. And what does it mean by consensual sexual activity? We can't just do whatever we want. So, because sometimes people will say, so if you're sex positive, so meaning if someone have sex with someone who is uh, 15, can lah, because both consensual, no, because that is not the age of consent in Malaysia. So just understanding that and having that active conversation. Um, because I remember when I was younger and I was watching porn, I didn't understand what was happening. It'll be nice to have someone, even though it's awkward, to sit with me and go like, you know, you see what it's here. This is not how you, you actually, this is not real life. Um, we need to have respect. Sex is a beautiful thing. Sex it's a, you know, and all that stuff. So um, I don't know if we answered your question, if I answered your question, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, it seems like sex positivity is actually not that, uh, not that much different from like what religion or like religious beliefs would also the, the way they see sex like it's something that is uh, you know has should be done a certain way or there are certain um, standards that that need to be set for it would you say yeah. that was the case Amiru? You know earlier you were talking about how uh, some things are too much or you know Amiru? Yeah. Yeah. Your, 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 your video was free. Hey, oh, okay. Can, can Did... you repeat the question? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, what I was saying was that from what uh, I'm hearing, it sounds like sex positivity and um, the way religion views sex is not always that different. Like, there are standards, there are certain ways that you can and cannot do things. Um, would you guys say that there are more? Um, similarities between these things or would you say that they're two like totally different things like sex positivity and um like you know being religious cannot go together uh 
Well, there are some similarities. I mean, a lot of similarities, of course, especially about the consent. But, but the huge difference is, I, uh, in most of religion, including Islam and Christianity, I guess, um, there are no uh, sex out of marriage. You know, all the sex is always within the marriage. That's why um, I think this is the most controversial part in the Western society, and of course, the secular society. When you know uh, the religious society, the Muslim of especially, uh, always advocates marriage as a solution. I think this is wrong as well. I mean, of course, marriage is part of solution to the Muslim, to, to having sex, but the larger solution is to to educate the Muslim society to to educate the people how to behave and how 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 to practice a, a healthy sex. I think that is more important. And if you cannot in Islam, if you cannot marriage, if you cannot perform the marriage, if, or you cannot, you know, you don't have the money, or you don't cannot commit to any commitment. What you can do is to have a self control. You know what they call it a puasa. Uh, most of the preachers always say, you know, puasa, puasa. But <clears throat> the puasa is it's all about the self restraint. It's all about self control, and it's very hard to do, of course. You know, uh, me as a married person, of course, sometimes during the Ramadan, I also fight with myself. You know, you have to control your sexual, uh, just, uh, your sexual uh, desire during the Ramadan. You know, all these things is, is not easy, of course. But uh, why, why Muslim, why Islam advocates puasa or, 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 or fasting as, 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 as the solution? Of course, it's, this is not the only solution, but it is a part of solution. You know, um, when uh, we, the sexual, uh, the sex, uh, uh, sexual education always talk about uh, how to educate your son not to be the rapist, for instance. The same like Islam, but how to educate it, part of it, to have a self control. But unfortunately, most in, in Muslim society, what we see. The process is all about, you know, your uh, fasting. You know, it's all about, you know, not to eat from the dawn to the to the end of the day. But it's more than that. It's about self control, it's about focus, and distract yourself from the the the, the 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 desire, the bad desire. Of course, sex is not the bad desire, but it can be bad if you perform it wrongly. It can be bad if you are doing it wrongly. This can be bad if you are do it more than the limit you should do. Right, like like overindulgence, lah. Yeah. Right. It's also like sorry. I just wanted to sort of interject. It's also very important to understand that when we talk about sex positivity, that whole idea of sex positivity, I know the word sex is there, but it's not to focus zooming in on just sexual acts. So someone who yeah. is sex positive is someone who believes that it is important for us to teach young, um, to teach children about their bodies according to the actual names of the bodies. Instead of saying my, my bum bum or my burung, we actually tell them to say the real, the real names. Because here's the thing, yeah. in the court of law, if a child touch wood, for example, or someone touch them inappropriately, in the court of law would not acknowledge the term, or oh, someone touch my bum bum. Mm. You know, they would say like someone touch my buttocks, or someone touch my, cannot say someone touch my burung and play with my burung, has to be someone touch my penis. And then when it comes to, for example, in kindergarten, if the, if the kid, Sort of say, uh, I sort of say the the vulva as uh, my muffin. Mm. So someone would say, oh, the 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 my friend lick my muffin. Bagi tahu dekat cegu. Actually, muffin is a different thing, right? It's, it's actually vulva, and so the teacher would just dismiss it as go like, oh, okay, muffin tak ada apa pun. So sex positivity is sort of the idea that we need to teach young children about safe, uh, about the actual body parts, and then talking about consent, and then talking about relationship. What is toxic relationship? What is healthy relationship? Understanding that, and also when it comes to dating, right? Um, a lot of the times, especially women, and I can say this for myself, is that I feel a lot of guilt when I say no to someone. Because, you know, I'm supposed to like, I'm supposed to follow, you know, like I cannot say no, I have to say yes, because I don't want to be awkward. I don't want to create, create this uh, whole awkwardness around me and, and this partner or whatever. But then 
consent talks about the importance of yes you can say no you can take back your consent if you're not comfortable you don't have to you don't have to be uncomfortable about it you can say no so this is the whole idea is to empower people about about all of this that you have to part. It's not just about sex. Sex is a very minor thing about it, but it's so much more than that. It's multifaceted, as we say again. And someone who is religious, someone who is not religious, even if you've never had any sexual experience at all, you can be sex positive. This is this idea that information and education is important. It's not about fear. Mm -hmm. That's what we have ever since we were children, is that it's fear. And, uh, and just to change that is to understand why is it like this? So that you can, we can make informed choices as, as people, right? And to guide the children. Yeah, that that's so awesome. Like you know, Amirul, earlier you were talking about how, um, you know, even Islam teaches not, uh, teaches that you know even men themselves need to have self control, and um, th this is not something that, you you know, we see a lot of things like in the Me Too movement and things like that, or from Western media, we see that a lot of them are saying that, oh, boys are not being taught uh, not to rape. It's more like, oh, girls need to take care of themselves or like, yeah. you know, women, it's women's, it's always women's responsibility. But what I heard from you was that um, religion actually teaches the other way around, you know, it teaches men to have self-control and to um, not do things that are basically wrong. Um, so how, like, how do you think um, Western media has affected like our culture here because I'm seeing some of that uh, coming in here as well, you know, in like uh, feminist discourse on social media, things like that. They are saying that, um, they're saying that, oh, e even women are always getting blamed all the time in our society. Is that, a, is that something that comes from like Western media or is it something that's already in our society, you know? Well, my biggest... One of my, my critics on the feminist movement is they tend to blame men all the time. I didn't say men is not, uh, it's always right. No, I didn't say, you know, men should be excused all the time or should, uh, are not the, 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 uh, the wrongdoer. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, um, Instead of keep blaming the men, you should also involve them and educate them. You know, nobody like to be pointing. You know, I'm 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 not the rapist, but when you when you have a, this hashtag all men blah blah blah, the men should blah blah blah. It's into all the men, which is also not rapist. Instead of keep blaming the men or have this narrative of men and women are are are, are conflicting each other. Why not have a narrative to build the society, to build the community together? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have seen from this movement when where men feel inferior, inferiority all the time. I have some friends who, you know, I I'm afraid to marry because, uh, you know, women will control of my life and you know all this movement etc. This is not healthy for me in any relationship. When the victim become the prey, so what I suggest to the feminist movement is not to uh, first of all to respect the man as a man, respect his masculinity, but of course we have to dismiss the toxic masculinity. So we have to differentiate between the toxic masculinity and the positive masculinity to be a protector of man. The Quran said, you know, a rijal or woman in uh, when the men are the protector of the women. So it's not, you know, women are, are, are weak in this, in, in, in this notion, on this narrative, but to show that the men have the responsibility to protect the community, to protect their wife, to protect their mother, to protect the child from any, uh, uh, to, from any bad happen. I mean, from any, any um, harassment, for instance. So uh, instead of keep blaming the men all the time, I think the Western society should learn how Islam treat the men and women equally. Of course, not most, not all Muslims treat uh, women and men equally, but the the, the essence or the basic of 
really just teaching us, teaching us to have uh, mutual respect and to have uh, uh, the integration and 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 um, interaction and also communication between the two genders, not right. to portray them as uh, conflicting. Uh, classes or conflicting genders all the time. I think this is very wrong conceptual and very wrong narrative uh, from right. the Western societies. Right. Jasmine, would you say that um, the kind of like discourse that's available on social media now is very influenced from the West as well? Um, I think I don't I don't know if it's uh, it's probably partially I mean these are all ideas right and ideas yeah. kind of like it flows everywhere and of course the the Western society are like more more sort of um, more vocal about a lot of things but I feel like it's not so much that it's influenced by the West we're just probably like more aware because of the vocality of like everybody around the world mm -hmm. that we're, we're kind of then looking at our society and go like wait. So if this is happening there, it does that mean it's happening here? And kind of like then zooming in into like, what is happening within our society? Is this the same thing that we're kind of facing? And sort of then being able to address that and go like, okay, well, we also face this kind of the same thing, but in our own cultural way. And how do we sort of balance that conversation with religion, with our traditions and have that active conversation as well? I totally hear you. Um, I totally hear you. I totally hear you, Amirul, with, with like, with, yes, feminist movement, sort of like there's a lot of times we hear about demonizing men and stuff like that. But I also believe that um, feminist movement, there's a lot of, again, different layers. So it's just where do you, which part of the movement that you kind of like, kind of will see, because I'm all about I'm empowering everybody. I'm all about having active conversation with both men and women and sort of like where can we find a middle ground or sort of and also having sort of I feel like men can never understand what women go through as much as we want to say like um, no you cannot blame men you cannot demonize men but the thing is it's definitely not all men. I'm, I've, of course a lot of, they would always say like hashtag all men but when we say the old men it's the old toxic men. It's, it's something that's really you know like for me personally, that's what I feel, the toxic men. And um, there was a lot of time that I would tell my guy friends what I go through. And a lot of them were just like, hey, it's a compliment what? They compliment you on the streets. They do this, you should be happy. But the thing is, women has been seen as a sexualized object for the longest amount of time. Whereas men were less so. Oh, you know, I won't say never, but less so. Um, so to say that it's a compliment is never a compliment. So I think, someone who is an ally this is where men and women can both come together and talk about what is the problem with toxic masculinity and stuff like that and become allies with each other then that this is where we can sort of work together and sort of like how do we then create this just this world where where you know everybody is able to work together and sort of understand each other's sort of problems because of course we don't want to blame but also this is what's happening especially to women and men can never understand that unless you are in our shoes and it's just tough. Um, but it's, it's a conversation that is really important to have, especially amongst everybody and, and to empower everybody too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. Like, I think there are certain things that, um, like I was, just I was just telling my husband the other day as well, like I would never get into a car and start fiddling around with things in the middle without like, locking the door straight away you know i think that's the kind of like fear um, yeah. men will never understand yeah mm -hmm. there was a post um uh, recently it was just a simple post about okay maybe like the way they worded it's not the best way but they were just saying like what would you do if there were no men for 24 hours you know i i would i would change it in a way what would you do if it was a well if you were just in an area of women for example and as simple as just i would like to just go out for a jog without being worried I would just like to um, wear whatever I feel like without having someone to like, you know, honk at me. Because again, um, I I was wearing really baggy shirt and baggy pants, and I get I got honked on five times that one time, and I'm I just feel so unsafe, and I had to clutch everything, I, I you know. Um, so to to have someone to say like, yeah, but like maybe it's just like you were so pretty. I'm like, no, you know. So. So it's like, how do we then sort of as society, how do we, how do we assist more men and women 
to, to, to make women feel safe, but also to have sort of the toxic men held accountable to what they've been told. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I do, I do wonder though, if like, um, like where, where this fear comes from, like, is it, is it really something that, um, re that some, is it something that really um, happens or is it like just this fear that, that exists because of uh, stories that we've seen online or like um, stories that our friends tell us and whether it's really a case of, uh, you, you know, how, how often do we really see like men attacking women on the street? Like, is that really a common occurrence? I don't know about attacking, I would always go away. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wouldn't try to be in a situation where I would put myself, but I've been in situations where I would have uh, people follow me and, mm -hmm. and you know follow me around the mall, for example, follow me to the car park and literally stand in front of my car park and wouldn't leave until I tell them to leave. I would go as simple as lining up for the ATM and there's like a stranger going into my personal zone and just asking me for my number. And I'm just like, I am just here to take money. Like, why are you? I've never been so far as, as having someone touch me and grope me. My friends have, um, have been groped and, and, you know, and that's horrible. Um, but I feel like also like coming back to the topic of sex in the digital age. Um, this is why a lot of platforms nowadays, I mean, going back into the conversation of sexual, uh, sex positivity in the digital age or sex in the digital age, websites like Pornhub, which is a pornography website, actually creates this, this whole thing um, on their website called the Pornhub Sexual Wellness Center, where they actually teach sex education to people and actually using um, real pornography material inside. So they have like that porn stars and really showing like if they're talking about how does a woman's body look like. So they actually show the actual body of a woman and like this is, this is the body, this is how it is. And the different sort of vulva or like with men and penises, they have different shapes of penises that it's not just the pornography penis that we're so used to, this mm -hmm. different body. And you know, we have this company selling um, toys. So in, they're in sex toys industry, technology, sex tech, um, sex toys technology. And they actually create a whole workshop on sex education, on understanding our bodies, both men and women. So it's really interesting to see how technology, sort of this company having that responsibility and creating these classes for, for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've even seen um, porn actresses on TikTok talking about how uh, sex in porn is performed and how it's not always, um, it, it's engineered as well. It's an engineered performance and it's not always uh, real, you know. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> so in Malaysia, right, or, or maybe, maybe uh, let me go back a little bit. Like there's a difference between sexual repression and uh, puritanical societies, right? You know, repression is when you can't express your sexuality while being puritanical is more about having a strict moral attitude towards sex. Uh, where do you think Malaysia falls uh, on this spectrum and uh, what are some of the factors for that? So this can be uh, either for Jasmine or Amiru, if he's still on. <laughs> Amiru's still here. Um, well, um, it's, it's very uh, interesting because, you know, uh, in state level, we have seen the very strict uh, policies on any sexual content, where the state try to have very uh, try to limit its own people, its own the society, uh, from accessing or, or even to know, even to educate themselves about sex. Sex, and this is very bad. This is including, you know, any censorship and the religious institutions such as Jakim itself. But however. If you look, if you look at the society level carefully, you can see how uh, sexual expression has been there for a long time in our history, in our literature, in our advertisement. As as you just said, you know they have you no know, have very sexual uh, notion and and, and uh, in, in, the, in the advertisement. So this is very interesting. Uh, back to your question. Earlier, you're talking about um, 
how this TikTok Muslim lady, you know, uh, have very explicit uh, dancing on the TikTok. Uh, this is also, as I said, when actually society, our society have been has been uh, stricted by the state itself, not by the society. I disagree. Some people say, you know, uh, Muslim society are very uh, close-minded, uh, restricting. No, if you look at our literature, our our heritage, there's no such things. For instance, if you go to the, our our fiqih book, fiqih is the Muslim rules book. You know, you can see how the words faraj and zakah is there. The words penis and 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 vagina is there. It's very clear. You know, even some they have some rulings about if you have a two to 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 have you have a large penis that uh, harm your your partner. There's a ruling on that. So it's very clear. So in our in Muslim society, I mean, in society level, a Muslim society, Muslim society actually open on this sexual discourse and discussions. Even in, in our Malay heritage, for instance, we have, but Malay, you know, because Malay have very babunga way of saying, they have very balapik way of saying, they didn't say it strictly. But you can understand if you go to Dikir Barat, for instance, if you go, especially in Dikin Barat, I don't know if you are fam a family with Dikin Barat, but I love Dikin Barat a lot. Uh, you can see how uh, it's very erotic uh, story behind the, the, the Dikir Barat. Actually, is that so? Uh, Muslim society, even the Arab society and the uh, Malay society, are very familiar with this uh, sex education. However, when we have this wrong Im imagination of how being um, a religious country how being a uh, country uh, from the islamists of course the, it started from 20, 20 something 24 if not mistaken started from the muslim brotherhood in egypt try to portray the state the muslim state under the revitan the moral revitan of the society then it started from you know it started from uh, from the uh, ritual uh, Leviathan, you know, they try to control the ritual, the praying, and so etc. And it go more and more until it invades our personal, uh, our personal sphere, private sphere. It try to edu try to teach us, or well, not to try to teach, try to control our uh, sexual behavior. This is very wrong, I guess, but. This is something that are very uh, unfortunate in our, our state, in our country, and a lot of Muslims' country. Mm -hmm. there, therefore, you can see, you know, the Arab porn everywhere. You can search in, 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 Google, in, in Google, the Arab porn is there. Right. You can see uh, how uh, the Arabs are very uh, appreciate even in their poems, the old poems, the ancient poems. You can see they are very uh, explicit and very erotic way of saying uh, about sex and, 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 and intercourse and whatsoever. But when it comes to, when it comes to state, especially the modern state, uh, the, the moral divide and try to, to control everything, including uh, the personal sphere, uh, what happened behind the door, what happened even in our bed. This is very unfortunate of society. I think right. this is should be state sorry amir i think you're breaking up a little bit um but from the people not like yeah yeah, yeah. hello so, sure, sorry please. uh yeah sorry i i think i don't know whether it was your connection or mine but you're breaking up a little bit but maybe we can hear from uh jasmine as well on this oh. uh, um dr Fais is here Oh, okay. Faisal is here. Hi, Faisal. Hi. How are you? Good, good. Your voice is quite faint. Yeah, your voice is a bit soft. Really? Uh, yeah. Earlier, it was okay, but suddenly, yeah. So, am I? Uh huh. Yeah, just a bit. Yeah, it's just a bit soft. Is it possible to increase the volume?
Uh, for me personally, like with regards to the question, um, I echo what Amir will say. Like, I mean, we're, I don't think we are repressed because, you know, there are there's so many, you know, materials around us and that's easily been, you know, that we can just easily access. So I feel like it's probably puritanical, but I mean, um, maybe Faisal could also give his input because, um, I mean, if, if saying that puritanical is more about having strict moral mm -hmm. attitude with sex, then... I guess it's more that because you know when it comes to sex, um, it's very we're, we are it's able to express our sexuality, but like in the in that I mean the heterosexuality of course, but within the confines of marriage, mm -hmm. um, is what it is encouraged right in our society. So I feel like that's what it is. There's no strict moral attitude to what sex should be within men and women in marriage. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I'm Amiral has dropped off. Um, hi, Faisal. Uh, maybe you can start with an introduction on yourself and uh, your work. Uh, oh, oh, no. We it's still, still had, soft. Yeah, it's still a bit soft. Yeah. What about now? We can, we can hear you, but you're just quite soft. I mean, we can still hear you, lah. Like, without earphones. Yeah, but I, I, I can hear you guys uh, very clear. Okay. Cool. Okay. It, it, it sounds better now. Maybe just increase your speaking volume a bit. All right. I mean, yeah, all right. This is good. Um, well, uh, I've been doing a lot of... Uh, oh, Fai sorry, Faisal. I think your phone is the one that's picking the volume, not yeah. your microphone. Yeah. I think your device that you're using is the one that's picking your volume. Because mm. when you, when you leave... Okay. It, yeah, so you can just you have to chabut the microphone. Uh, chabut the microphone, the the mm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, right. not, yeah. okay, now better? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, uh, I, I've been doing a, a, a research on um, uh, Malay sociology uh, for uh, NUS or National University of Singapore uh, for quite a while now. Uh, especially um, on Johor Riau uh, uh, sexual revolution uh, during 19, 18th, 19th century, which is very quite interesting um, uh, using uh, artisan tools. I've been using um, uh, Raja Ali Haji and Kati Jatarong's uh, texts um, uh, to examine uh, the phenomenal during during that era, and uh, but before before we going uh, deeper into that, um, it is important for us to to, to understand that um, uh, the it's the, there's a dysfunctional uh, you know when we talk about about sexology usually we use a Western framework. This is very wrong, you know, uh, because. Um, when we look at at, uh, at the Malay society, for example, uh, the sexual acti activities uh, sometimes, you know, uh, among the Western, they, they 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 keep they label us as you know they label certain activities as dysfunctional or incorrect uh, in the society. But uh, in Malay society, that dysfunctional and incorrect activities. You know, sexual activities might be uh, functional and useful. You know, uh, for example, um, ritualized homosexuality, yeah, uh, or what we call boy inseminating practices, where uncles or daddies, you know, uh, grandfathers um, teach uh, young boys about uh, sexual activities. You know, about sexual organs and stuff like that. And also um, uh, traditional massage. Uh, if um, if you look at it, I mean, it's it's very erotic. It's very sensual. It's um, I mean, d using the Western framework is um, is totally mm -hmm. wrong, you know. But um, for the Malays, uh, they look at this differently from different perspective. That's why uh, if you read. One of uh, one of a very interesting novel by Henry Fauconnet, uh, a French uh, residing in uh, in Selangor, uh, 
uh, in Malaya back then. She, he's a, he's a, this Oramando, he's a supervisor in a, in a very vast estate, uh, rubber estate. Uh, he found that he found a very interesting sexual activity, sexual um, uh, perspective that different from 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 the way that uh, the French people. I mean, connecting French and sexual revolution. Of obviously, I mean, like French are, people are very daring, very open about it. So, uh, but Malays, um, uh, if I mean, I, I've I've heard you know during my technical issues. I mean, that Amir Mominin. Uh, stated that um, the Malays uh, use a lot of kiasan, you know, uh, berhalus, not very direct. Um, from my uh, fr from my research, especially during the Johor Riau um, uh, sexual revolution, I mean, it, it's, it's it's not true. I mean, like the Malays are very uh, outspoken. The Malays, they are very direct about about uh, sex sex activities, and uh, the text that. Um, especially um, uh, old manuscripts, if you look at it, uh, it's very daring, it's very open, it's very uh, direct, um, stating uh, stuff that are very shocking. I mean, I mean, for, for, for us uh, today, I mean, we won't even uh, write like that or say like that, uh, speak like that um, uh, openly, publicly. But um, the Malays uh, at that time, during the 18th and 19th century, uh, I mean, their, their behaviors are very, very bizarre, you know? Yeah, that, that's for introduction. Right. <laughs> Thanks for that. Now, now I'm quite curious about what that biz bizarre behavior is. I'm very curious are. too. <laughs> yeah. Like, history is so interesting. I really yeah. love history. Yeah, totally. Um, and I also like what you said about how we need to examine sex from a, a not so much like a Western perspective, but because our context is very different <laughs> Um, so just before you hopped on, I was talking to Jasmine and Amirul about, um, you know, the difference between sexual repression and purita pur puritanical, um, you know, behaviors and whether, you know, which part of the spectrum they think Malaysia falls in, whether it's more like sexually repressed or puritanical. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, whether it's, um, you mean, uh, the, 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 uh, it's religion, uh, hmm. you think, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, because okay, let us look at the um, uh, Malay sex scandals during the Malay Malacca Sultanate. Yeah, Malacca Sultanate is if if you ask people around, if you ask historian, if you ask uh, the conservatives, for example, uh, they will surely say that um, the Malacca Sultanate is the peak of Islam. Yeah, because Islam arrived uh, during the time, I mean, uh, during Raja Kecil Besar's uh, uh, time. And then um, it, uh, Malacca has been very uh, central yeah, uh, in propagating and disseminating um, uh, Islam all over Southeast Asia and all over. Uh, in fact, even uh, we have connection uh, with uh, Pasai Perla eh, among the very first states. Uh, maritime state, maritime states that uh, uh, accepted Islam during that time, but if you look at uh, what happened uh, in the Malacca court, uh, it's very different. Yeah, it's it's very it's it's really. Um, I mean, like it's like religion uh, is is totally ignored here. Yeah, for example, we've heard about a uh, old party by Hang Jebat. Yeah. Uh, in protesting what happened to 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 Hang Tuah, mm -hmm. for example, in uh, Hikayat Hang Tuah, it stated Laksamana Hang Tuah, ialah yang masyur di dalam Melaka hulu balang yang perkasa dan ialah yang membunuh Hang Jebat yang menderhaka mengambil gundik raja di lawan yang bermuka. Uh, that particular line is about uh, sexual orgy uh, in Melaka court. And then we have this uh, very interesting figure named Raja Zainal. He is uh, actually Raja Mahmud or Sultan Mahmud Shah's uh, brother. And he also have this uh, behavior, bizarre behavior that organizing uh, sexual orgies or parties uh, in Malacca court. Uh, for example, in Sulalatu Salatin, is he stated, let me pick it up. Yeah. Shahadan apabila mangkatlah ia menggantikan kerajaannya, putranya yang bernama Raja Mahmud bergelar Sultan Mahmud Shah. 
Maka masa kerajaan baginda inilah ia membunuh saudaranya itu iaitu yang bernama Raja Zainal kerana Raja Zainal itu adalah baik parasnya cantik manis memberi gairat segala hati perempuan melihat ianya Min Sultan Mahmud Shah um, dictated uh, Raja Zainal to be killed ya yeah, because he, he's jealous of him dan banyaklah anak-anak orang Melaka berahi akan dia hingga anak isteri orang tiada lah berketentuan mengidah Raja Zainal itu dengan bunga bergubah dan sirih bersulur I mean this is a activities that when, when you like, I mean it's to flirt when you like someone, I mean that you you give sirih lah, yeah, something like that. Mana-mana yang perkenan diambilnya dan mana-mana yang tiada berkenan diberikannya kepada segala juak-juaknya. Maka cabulah negeri Melaka itu dengan hal yang demikian itu. Maka menitahlah Sultan Mahmud itu akan seorang hambanya menikam saudaranya Raja, Raja Zainal itu malam-malam pada tempat peraduannya itu. Maka telah mangkatlah Raja Zainal itu digemparkan oleh oranglah dalam negeri itu mengatakan Raja Zainal itu mangkat ditinggal oleh pencuri orang adanya. That's not just that. I mean there are many other incidents among others where Sultan Mahmud uh, 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 so-called killed the whole family of Tun Fatima and then forced marriage. I mean you know what happened to Tun Fatima. And also during Johor Lama when Sultan Mahmud Shah been killed um, dia kan um, Sultan Mahmud mangkat di Julang kan. Um, there's a there's a sex scandal behind behind the episodes where um, Henry um, uh, Chambert Law, one of the famous historian, French historian, uh, looking at it, looking at this uh, this particular text, Sulalatu Salatin, stated that um, Sultan Mahmud Shah is actually a homosexual, and actually he. Uh, he he abducted many many uh, boys uh, during that time and uh, forced uh, them to have sex with them. I yeah, have to have sex with him. So um, this is among the bizarre things. I mean, like whether uh, religion is an element here. I mean, uh, from these texts, historical texts. If you read, if we read it, I mean, it's obvious that although that we have uh, something like undang-undang uh, syariah during Malacca time it's been totally um, uh, ignored or totally being uh, dropped uh, for example uh, during this time and this is not just uh, among the palace people yeah among 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 the kings and and, uh, and the prince but it's also among the, uh, the behavior of uh, of uh, uh, ordinary people because uh, in hikayat hangtua Uh, when Tun Tija arrived from Pahang, there's a there's a episodes of a lot of sex uh, activities happened during that time, and people just stopped doing sex at that time, and uh, they ran out to to the, to the street to have a look who arrived. Yeah, Tun Tija arrived from Pahang. So this is a, a, a among bizarre things uh, happening, and this happened uh, also during the 18th century because if we read uh, Munshi Abdullah. Um, Ikaib pelayar pelayar Musi Abdullah ke Kelantan dan Terengganu, we have this also. I mean, like it's totally. I mean, um, people people do this uh, in open space and publicly, and people speak about it. So what happened? I mean, we need to to have a sociological perspective. What happened? Uh, why are uh, uh, this so-called um, uh, openness uh, uh, on sexual activities have been suddenly? Um, been uh, different uh, uh, during this time. I mean, in sex uh, during this age. I mean, uh, we are we are not we are hiding uh, stuff like this. It's not that open anymore. Why? I mean, like, we we need, that's why I'm I'm doing this so-called research. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what I wanted to go into as well. Like, it's interesting that you point out that all these things were happening openly in the past, whereas now where we have all these different, you know, like dating apps, we have. Um, We have like apps and like sex toys that allow uh, for more, you know, like virtual sex or even to have like a mix of like physical and virtual sex with devices and uh, a mix of devices and apps, you know. Why, why is it that um, it, it seems like young people are having less sex now? I mean, I just read an article about that. Um, what what would you guys uh, comment on that or what, you know, what what have you guys read as well and what do you know about the atmosphere of sex in this age today um this question is uh for <laughs> uh, maybe 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 jasmine since you're like working in the you know it's such a tough question like um 
I mean, obviously, I, I haven't read the research on that. Um, uh, who knows? It could be the pandemic, <laughs> <laughs> limited people from from you know engaging and you know in, in intimacy, perhaps. Um, I, I kind of have like kind of like a question to like I mean I guess to everybody just listening because earlier we were talking about you know are we the conversations that we have here like is it more Western or not just listening to the history of, of Malaya and the Sultan and everything like that like this whole idea of being very promiscuous or sexual it's just interesting sort of like it's it has its history somewhat I know it's not related to the question but I'm just kind of pondering on what Faisal just said in relation to today's time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think it is interesting that um, you know we're supposedly in a in a more liberal society now and yet we don't talk about sex in the same way that it, it used to be talked about, you know. Like I mean how often do we hear about orgies and I don't think they would go down in our history books. <laughs> well, it's there, but it's not in the history books that we're used to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. W would you say? Would you say that um, sex is still? Uh, I mean, it sounds like it wasn't that taboo back in the eighteen hundreds. How how did it? How would you say it uh, progressed to become like more taboo now? Maybe Faisal, you can um, answer that. Yeah. Um... So this is, uh, I've mentioned uh, about, about my research uh, earlier. So what happened during um, the 18th and 19th century? Why? Why suddenly people become shy? Or why suddenly people become less um, open about, about sexual activities? So I have this very interesting hypothesis where, um, you know, I've been collecting a lot of stuff and uh, uh, as a mining and analyzing um, um, Many aspects of, of, of what happened during the Johoria era. Yeah, so uh, we need to understand what happened in Johoria uh, at that time. This is around um, 1784, um, 1890s, something like that. Yeah, so uh, around 100 years. So what happened is um, it's very interesting um, that Johoria at that time. Um, being under uh, Yang Dipatuan Muda, uh, or Yang Tuan Muda in 18, 1845, uh, has, he had been attracted to so-called wah Wahhabization, yeah? Uh, because uh, he went to Hajj, um, according to Barbara Andaya, one of the famous historians, he went to Hajj and possibly he adopted uh, this so-called approach, this repeat approach, and bring and brought it back to, to Johoria, and there are a, a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, uh, evidences that uh, he is very keen uh, to this. Although that we know that he practiced uh, Tarika Nashabandia, but we need to understand that Tarika Nashabandia, although it's, it's part of a uh, Asau in Tarika, so it's very different from from the Fit. I mean, like Mirabo meaning it earlier. But Tarika Nashabandia is the most, um, uh, it's the less, um, or perhaps uh, it's more uh, fake oriented compared to other 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 stuff, other, other Tarika. Yeah? So uh, during that time, the Salafization and the Tarika Nashabandia has been very dominant uh, in Johoria. For instance, yeah, um, if we read um, Tufat al Nafis, Faraj Ali Haji, uh, we understood that. Happened is um, uh, during the Johoria era, um, there's a squat, sort of like a badar squat, going around every morning uh, to peep uh, in the toilets of, uh, of people, you know, belakang rumah, untuk pastikan um, ada bili air itu uh, basah, to make sure, to ensure that people wake up, uh, they, they, uh, people wake and uh, uh, then sembahyang um, subuh, uh, yeah, to make sure. Yeah, to, and then uh, at that time also, um, uh, this uh, the, the law uh, enforcing women to start wearing veils have been uh, applied. And it's it's very extreme uh, to, to the extent that majlis berpantun uh, have been banned 
and people playing chatur chess and people playing um, not just chess i mean uh, gasing um a few others yeah i can remember right now have also been banned and this is for around 100 days so my hypothesis is that uh suddenly from that openness uh, people have been uh, so called um, hiding their sexual tendencies yeah you know their, their sexual needs and because of this um the the, the activities have been uh, hidden and become uh, more intense in a way yeah if we read the text from the, the 18th and 19th centuries there are a lot of uh, sexual activities that sort of like um uh, orang macam pendam uh, repress dan mereka mengamalkan uh, uh, aktiviti seks yang salah you know? uh, because of uh, this kind of repression uh, jadi um, apa yang berlaku sort of what uh, we look at um, uh, katakan uh, ada pendakwah yang dituduh melakukan uh, sexual activities uh, yang salah ya uh, hari ini itu juga berlaku pada waktu itu yeah uh from from the, there are a lot of texts yeah macam macam syair syair lu lu syair um there are a few others yeah uh, because my mind is everywhere scattered everywhere uh, uh ada ada macam macam teks yang 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 kita boleh hujahkan yang yang menunjukkan perkara ini because what happened is that sex activities have been repressed jadi uh, kerana itu mereka telah melakukannya sembunyi-sembunyi dan lebih teruk daripada keadaan sebelum itu yeah uh yeah Yeah. Okay. Um, if I, I may add something. Yes, please. Um, I don't know. I, I do agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Faisal about you know how the state tried to hide and control the sexual behavior amongst the people throughout history. In fact, this is not just happening in 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 Muslim society in uh, in Malaysia or in Malaya or in, or in Tanah Melayu. It's also happened in uh, Western history. You can see how the European government, how the Catholic government, try to hide, try to control all these uh, sexual activities and behavior. But despite of all that, to blame the Wahhabi himself, I think this is quite unfair. Uh, I do agree, Wahhabization is, is, is play a big role on these matters. But something, uh, even though if we adopt the Sufism teachers, uh, for, for, for the Malayu, I mean, if the Malay adopt the Sufism teachers, the Sufism also teach us how to control and how to not the off limits, you know, how not to go the beyond the boundaries. But the boundaries, of course, in Sufi is quite loosened comparing to the Wahhabis and the Fiqh, uh, Fiqh uh, boundaries, you know. Uh, you can see how uh, the, the gay behavior, the homosexual behavior, are allowed in in certain part in Ottoman palace, which is Ottoman, uh, the Kerajaan Osmania, the Ottoman Empire, are highly uh, adopting the, Suf the Sufism uh, order in in their in their in their palace. But something that I think uh, all Muslims, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not applying this to the Muslim, but especially the Muslims uh, have to acknowledge there are there are always a limit on the you know to to, to express your pleasure or what so not. Uh, I'm I'm not against uh, Dr. Faisal, please not mistaken, but I have to note this down because I don't want to people think that you know uh, when we try to demonize Wahhabi, which is actually a demon, but uh i don't want people to uh, mistakenly everything that uh muslim don't do or muslim cannot do is everything is all about wahhabi no that's all right um <clears throat> so since you since you mentioned you know like homosexual behavior and things like that i actually wanted to bring up um one of a, a book that i've been reading recently the professor by dr faisal um, and in it, you you in it you are exploring the themes of you know LGBT and uh, religious fundamentalism as well as like human rights, and you know that was written in twenty seventeen and um, uh, you know in this digital age things progress very quickly, right? Um, do you think that do you think that the attitudes towards um, LGBT issues 
are the same now compared to you know when you wrote that book or ha have things improved? Um, 2017 to 2020, I think nothing, not, <laughs> nothing much improved. Um, and uh, we are confined uh, staying you know, at home yeah, uh, because of the situation of a pandemic. Uh, but um, glad that you 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 stated uh, you, you've mentioned about 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 this novel of mine. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's derived from from uh, my research on uh, traditional human rights. Yeah, and uh, I've been looking into into ways of understanding uh, the, the the LGBT phenomena, uh, especially in the Malay world in Malay, Malay archipelago. And um, what I found is very interesting because. Um, if, if you read that novel, uh, yeah, the professor. This is the English translation of our professor, actually, uh, 2020. Uh, it stated about um, there's a, a different. I mean, I, I, I stated earlier that uh, if we use if we use a Western framework, I mean, like we will find ourselves uh, in a in a very, you know, um, kind of in a situation, but. If we look into ourselves, I mean, using our own framework, uh, especially the Malay framework, uh, what we find is that um, the Malay society have been uh, quite tolerant uh, to the LGBT groups in a way, especially the trans, yeah, um, and uh, especially in Makassar, the, I mean, our gender uh, categorization is very different. It's not it's not just male and female, mm -hmm. but there are others, yeah. So we even have a five genders. So uh, if we look at uh, these so-called genders, it's almost similar to the the, the Red Indians and in, in America. Yeah, we we even have we even recognize the asexual people, people who doesn't have uh, sexual orientation. Yeah, so LGBT iq 2 s something like that right so uh this this uh, uh, framework if we look uh, into it and we use uh this framework uh we can we, we can have a, a different perspective different treatment uh towards uh, the lgbt groups um yeah mm -hmm. would you say that um social media has helped with like advocacy for these groups of people, and and perhaps Jasmine, if you've seen if you've seen that on social media, because I know you're quite you're quite active in that digital sphere, right? Have you seen like more advocacy on this, and um, has I guess the use of social media and digital tools helped in that area? Um, yeah, definitely. Social media definitely brings up the conversation and brings up the awareness um, about this topic. Um, so it definitely plays a big, big role. I mean, not just in the in talking about in inclusivity in terms of sexuality, but also in sort of accepting the different sort of our bodies, different body sizes, especially within the body acceptance movement or body positivity movement. That's a, social media plays a big, big role. So yeah, definitely. And also within the Malaysian context, I think internationally, the conversation of inclusivity in terms of sexuality is very, very alive and well. Um, and everyone is trying to have like a more inclusive way of calling people. For example, instead of saying you guys, um, they are advocating for the words of you all, you folks, or everybody. So to make it more inclusive, uh, inclusive, which is which is great. Um, in the Malaysian context, however, there are this sort of it's not there are conversations about inclusivity, but it's not so apparent. Um, I think in Malaysian context, in terms of the sexual education sphere or sex positivity within Malaysia, it's more on sort of um, talking about untabooing taboo topics such as period, so mm -hmm. periods. Um, uh, sexual education within comprehensive sexuality education within schools and stuff like that. So having more conversations on that, as well as raising awareness about um, reproductive rights, reproductive health, and and um, abortion too. That you know, yeah, that conversation. So it's it's definitely social media again to reiterate. They do definitely help mm -hmm. the awareness. Right. Yeah. Would you say that um, you get a lot of, uh, you, you know, like negative negative comments or is there like a lot of, um, how, how do I say, like 
negative pushback to like the ed- the education work that you're doing online? Um, surprisingly, not really. I do have the occasional, you know, just to give a context. So my page talks about um, sexual education or sex positivity, this sort of topic, and I cater more towards adults, so not kids, right? So adults meaning 20 and above. So that's the group that I cater to. Um, I don't get a lot of pushback. In fact, they, I was quite surprised to know that there were actually a lot of people who actually just wants to share the story. They don't necessarily want to have advice. They just want a listening ear because it's such a stigmatized conversation to have. And you know, there's a lot of shame and, and stigma and judgment around it that they just want to share the stories. I do get the occasional, are you Muslim? Is the, um, the biggest one. Right. Um, doesn't happen all the time, but like that's one of the ones that I get, which which is understandable, right? Like I look neither Chinese nor no Indian, so therefore I must be Malay. Um, so so which is understandable. But those are the kind of conversations I like to have then, and to sort of see what makes you say that, what you know, what how do you connect us just to, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess social media has been a really great tool for like uh, starting these conversations as well. Um, I actually have a question from from the Q&A section to Amirul. Uh, what exactly is too much in sexual expression and what is still deemed okay? Uh, would you say that Islam is sex positive but within limits and bounds? Yeah, I would say definitely yes. Uh, what is too much? Well, um, Islam is all about balance of everything. Balance, you know, if you have, uh, they are a saying or in the Sufi thought that uh, humble hearted, the slave of the materialistic, humble wanita, the slave of women, humble lelaki, the slave of husband, or the slave of sex. You know, you can be the slave of your own desire. Uh, that is what the limit of the, the Islamic teaching, at least from I, I understand. I'm not represent, representing the whole Muslim thought or the whole Muslim society, but this is what the thing. So do everything in moderation. Uh, you know, if you push everything beyond the boundaries, for instance, if you okay, you have a sex in the morning, the next in the evening, and it's in the night, and all the days of it, like, all about the sex, and everything you will sexualize everything. You know, you even can sexualize a carrot in front of you, you know, this is very wrong, yeah, yeah. So, then, then this and this is happening, you know, some I have some friends in jokes, of, of course, I feel this, thing, you know, in moderation, right? And, and of course, of course, everyone has their own. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, different limits, you know, but you know your limits. It's about you, yourself, your health, you know, you have to know about your, your body. You have to know, you know, you have to mengenal diri dan mengenal Tuhan. That's why the words come from, you know, know yourself and you know the God. So you know yourself and you know what God wants you to do. But first you have to know your, yourself, know about your health, know about the, your sexual behavior. Is this right or wrong? Mm-hmm. This is good or not, you know. If you have, well, if you want to have sex with everything, so this is this is not good. If you want to have sex with the kambing, the wolf, this is not good. You know, this is a, this is the limitation. You want to have sex with a, a, a child, then you become a pedophile. Yeah. This is not good. So this is what uh, if you want to have sex with your wife, uh, without her consent, consent. You know, without her cream. This is not good. This is the, the limit. So. You know the limits, you know, if you push the boundary. I mean, of course, everyone has their, every, in each individual, they have their own limits and you set the limits. But to, to, to know your limits, you have to know yourself. Uh-huh. That's, that's how the words came, mengenal diri, maka mengenal Tuhan. Know yourself and you know the God. I mean, you know the religion. First, you have to know yourself and keep balance of everything in your life. It's all about balance, it's all about limitation and self-control. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so since you're talking about... I mean, sorry. of course, uh, I want to quote something from a great Sufi scholar. 
you know, uh, a great Sufi scholar, I, a well-known great Sufi scholar, Ibn Arabi, uh, you know, he said, I used to hate sex when I first came, became a Sufi. Then I realized sex is very good and is make me closer to the God. So this is very interesting. So, I mean, the Sufis does not uh, abandon sex, does not uh, avoid sex, does not see sex as disgusting thing, as disgusting activities, but in fact, you meraikan, but within the limitation of the sex. Mm -hmm. Right. So since since you were mentioning like you know indulgence as well, um, and and now now that we have you know digital tools that even enable people to have uh, sex with each other even if they're you know long distance or even during a pandemic when they're apart, um, do you think that these tech developments could be a good thing or are there like? Would there be negative effects that might come out of that as well? Both, I guess. Yeah. Right. Uh, you shall. I mean, uh, my concern on this so-called digital sex is privacy. Mm -hmm. If you send a, a picture, then somebody can hack it and can lick it. Islam is also also about dignity. It's also about privacy. So. This is also one of my concern. You have a boyfriend, you know, you have consent. You send her, you send him your picture. Then let's say one day you you break up and he spread your your, your picture. This is also something. Uh, this also can happen to wife and husband. You know, a couple, then a married couple, then they get divorced, and uh, the husband can spread or the wife can spread the 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 the, 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 yeah, the, the picture of the husband. This is also. My concern. So, it comes both ways. It can be benefits, especially for long distance, and of of course, it's specific. It's of course, it's uh, permitted for 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 marriage couple to do such as they want. But uh, something that you have to take in your concern is about your privacy. That's all. I guess uh, about you know. I I'm, I'm I personally have no problem with uh, any toys or any platform that you want to have. This is your, your your privacy, your own personal things. But please, uh, concern about your dignity, concern about your don't take it for granted. That's it. Yeah. So I, I, I do I do advocate. I mean I do uh, see this as positive. But please keep on your mind. There is always a loophole that 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 they can can harm you in in unacceptable way. Or yeah. And, I, and even unexpected way. So this is right. That, that's a very um, interesting point you brought up. Like there is a risk um, to that as well. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if, like, uh, Jasmine, in your like sex positivity uh, or sex education sort of uh, content, is this something that you address as well? And um, how, like, how, how would you go about doing it? Oh yeah, definitely. It's so important. Safety is so important. Um, safety is, is the main thing and also like doing too much of something will lead you to addiction. That's mm -hmm. also like very important to sort of raise awareness on when it comes to safety of um, of the thing. So like the way I would discuss it, so I would have an active conversation about, okay, hey, do you, you, if you want to send pictures, that's great. You know, it, it's a way for you to connect with your partner and that's wonderful. But know that there are safety issues, there are risks into this. So if you want to send something, don't send something with your face on. Right, it's very important because this actually happened to um, to someone that I know, who whose pictures were actually plastered all over Facebook, and the person, the partner, tagged the uh, friends and family. So I woke up one day at, on some Sunday. We woke up at eight o'clock and just just straight away pictures, full body nudity, and it was just really sad. So luckily, I, I just called them up and just said that this is happening and. You know, and then from that on, like I'm very hyper aware of the risk. So, again, you know, in the, my education of you know, sort of bringing awareness, it's like knowing that there are risks, and this is how you should do it safely if you want to do it. Otherwise, there is no, you know, and also you do it consensually, right? You don't do it because someone forced you. There's a lot of that element as well, like oh, but then it's always like buggy, buggy, but never buddy. Mm -hmm. So, like, minta, minta. So you know, there's always this 
like oh dia minta saja my picture tapi tak pernah bagi balik so you know and all these different things right yeah. right um do you think Faisal that there is a uh, human rights element to this as well because you know for example the whole um, you know there was this whole like chat group thing where people were sharing um uh, I, like, I don't want to. I don't want to call it revenge porn because it, it doesn't sound like what it's. It's basically like sharing photos without consent, sharing photos and videos without consent. Um, do you think that there is a human rights element to this as well? And how um, can something like this be uh, remedied, or is there like a something that someone could do about it? I think that it's very obvious because uh, just like Amiro stated earlier, uh, the, the very important part of uh, human rights uh, is not just camaraderie, uh, love, but also um, dignity. Yeah, it's very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of this, uh, we need to really uh, understand that dignity um, uh really really have uh, been uh, abused or really have been uh, uh, violated when we have this kind of uh so-called uh hacking so, yeah uh, and this is a, uh, something that uh we have we need to look into and because of that human rights are very important human rights are, are very um I mean, uh, together with uh, uh sex education we need to have also human rights education so that's the balance in a secular society yeah because um uh, in secular society uh, other than a uh, religion um, the, um sources of moral are also coming from so-called human rights yeah and because of that and we when we have that yeah uh, we understand uh, uh the private space yeah for example and dignity so uh logically we will uh, adhere and we will celebrate um this space this private space others private space especially in, uh, the, uh, in the in the digital era yeah mm -hmm. yeah would you say that it's harder to uh, implement like human rights laws and things like that in this digital age or enforce these laws Sorry, could you guys hear me? Yeah, we yeah. could. I, I think it's a. Oh, wait, it's, it's a you could you could repeat the question, right? Um, yeah. So, Doctor Faisal, I was asking if, like, would you say that it's harder to enforce these human rights uh, laws in this digital age because it's just so hard to um, track down who's sharing what content, right? Hi, Dr. Faisal, can you hear me? Hello? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, yeah, okay, uh, no worries then. Um, yeah, we're, we're about to wrap up, but um, do you guys have, oh, do you folks have anything else that, um, you know, you want to share? Um, I think when it comes to, to with as with anything with whatever belief system you're in or sort of um you know whatever, whatever it, is, it is very very sort of, sort of <laughs> i can hear myself, I can hear myself. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, from uh, my, from my, my, uh, <laughs> i'm gonna okay i'm gonna mute him first yeah. okay <laughs> Yeah, I think I think as with anything, whatever we've learned today, I think the conversation is really fruitful and it's really it's really such a great conversation in all the different types of angles. And so I would really sort of um, encourage everyone to do more research into it to sort of understand yourself um, what we've been talking about. Uh, and yeah, such a yeah, great conversation to have. And to, to encourage everyone to have active conversation with different people of different sort of um, ideology, um uh, input and you know just have that active conversation and not just to limit yourself within your own circle it's that's really important when it comes to sort of education and and uh yeah raising awareness on the issue
you're going to mute it. Um, Faisal, can you hear us? Um, no, I can't hear you. I I can't hear you guys actually. Suddenly, oh. I don't know what happened. Can you hear us now? Uh, very soft. Very very. Seems like you're very far. Oh, can you increase your device volume? Yes, it's uh, already maximum. <laughs> oh. Okay, but but I was asking earlier if you thought it was harder to enforce human rights laws in this digital age because it's quite hard to like track down who's sharing the content and things like that, right? Uh, like it or not, I mean, this is why um, human rights education comes together with other educations. You know, um, that's why um, as a as a human rights defender, and uh, I mean. I teach a traditional human rights um, uh, in, in my institute. Um, I've been um, uh, emphasizing uh, human rights, especially uh, looking into the, the the traditional aspects of it. Yeah, you know, we, we have modern human rights, and of course, we have traditional human rights. We don't have Western or Eastern human rights, so uh, or Islamic human rights. So what what I what I'm uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, human rights education comes together with everything, uh, and especially with sex education. Uh, nowadays, yeah, uh, we can uh, solve many other things. I mean, like, uh, we need to understand s s things, s uh, stuff like pedophilia, yeah, um, hacking other people's uh, devices, for example. And uh, this comes together with with uh, human rights education. I mean whether we like it or not. Um, that's why, I mean, like we just celebrated uh, Human Rights Day on 10th of December. That's why human rights are very important. And I mean, the, the future for it is uh, human rights. Yeah, uh, uh, it needs to come together with everything. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, really, I really like what uh, you said. And it seems like our like Malaysians could benefit from a combination of education from different sources, you know, sex positivity, human rights, as well as maybe like even uh, religious um, practices as well. Um, but before we go, Amirul, do you have anything or like closing words that you want to add? Uh, well, um, I have nothing much to say. But uh, to, to 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 tell that sex is unnecessarily against religion or vice versa. I mean, sex is part of our life, and religion also is part of our life. The problem is interpretation of religion. The problem is how the religion has been. Uh, institutionalized by state and he became the leviathan of moral but at the same time as a human being we have to know our limits on everything so the limitation the self-limitation is very important not to go to beyond the boundaries not to go off limits so and of course sex education to educate yourself about se your sexuality your, your about uh, about uh, your own uh, sexual tendencies, your own sexuality is very important. Uh, as a religious person, you have to follow the rules, but of course, a uh, different school of thought have a different rules. I mean, Islam is all about that, you know. But choose wisely, that fits to your own sexuality. Do not oppress your sexuality. This is very important. You know, because if you oppress your own sexuality, you either you became rebels one day, rebellious one day, or perhaps you will collapse. So you have to mara'i kind your own sexuality, but please keep the limit, not go off the limit. Everything's about balance, life is about balance. That's all. Thank you. Um, Dr. Faisal, do you have anything uh, to add? 
Yeah, um, I think when it comes to um, sex education uh, and human rights, um, as someone uh, from Malay studies, uh, I like to look uh, from this so-called Malay perspective. Um, and when I said Malay, it uh, consists of not just Malay during Islam, but also Malay during uh, pre-Islam, yeah? So, um, for example, uh, I mean, like uh, earlier uh, speaker have, uh, have uh, stated that uh, how the usage of certain language uh, for the LGBT people uh, have been sort of like, I mean, people, uh, the awareness and consciousness of using certain, uh, how to address uh, LGBT uh, uh, friends, yeah. I mean, in, in Malay language, um, we don't have so-called he or she untuk kata ganti nama kedua atau kata ganti diri ketiga. Uh, kita gunakan dia untuk semua lelaki dan perempuan. Kita gunakan um, awak, kamu uh, yang tidak ada gender. Yeah? So this is one element of it. And I've stated uh, uh, pre-Islam, uh, we have five genders. Yeah. Uh, even we have a magic genders that actually um, relate to the to the to the trans yeah and um if we look at it i mean if you we, we try to combine this this so-called malay and islam yeah uh dengan kita menggunakan uh, ini dia akan menjadi suatu yang yang berbeza dengan uh, middle east kind of islam yeah and Dengan juga kombinasi with the combination of human rights, traditional human rights. Uh, I've I've written a lot of it in in this book, the professor. Kita juga akan be, me, uh, mengetahui dan mendalami aspek uh, bagaimana hak asasi manusia itu sangat bergandingan dengan aspek-aspek hidup yang lain, other aspects of life, and this is including uh, uh, sex. Yeah. Dan jika kita berpegang kepada um, uh, Melayu masa lampau ini dengan kombinasi uh, Islam dan juga dengan kombinasi uh, zaman modern digital age kita akan tahu we, we have our own source uh, different from other civilization ya yeah, itu yang uh, yang ingin saya tambah mungkin dalam forum ini okay thank you so much um, thank you so much, panelists, for the sharing session today. It was really amazing. I learned a lot. Um, and it's always nice to hear from like different perspectives. Um, if you guys, if you all want to share your, you know, Instagram handles or, um, you know, any other resources that people can go to, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you all for being here and thank you audience for being amazing and uh, spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Thank you uh, Project Dialogue for having us, especially uh, it is very um, the haru to have uh, a same task with Dr. Faisal. Thank you again for Project Dialogue for such opportunity. Okay, th th thank you all. Thanks Amiru, thanks Jasmine, thanks Dr. Faisal. Bye. How to leave? Okay, this one. <laughs> yeah.